Um, I'm Paula Diamond Roman. I'm the female Democratic district leader for the Broadway Democrats. My co-district leader is Curtis Arlock. Our club president is Amy Porter. We represent the area from around 106th Street to 125th Street Park to Park, um, Manhattan Valley, Morningside Heights, little teeny bit of, of um, Southwest Harlem. And I am putting my, um, the contact information for the club in the box if anyone wants to get in touch with us after this. And I think um, Curtis is next. Hello everyone, thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Curtis Young. I'm the co-president of Uptown Community Democrats. We represent the 71st and the 72nd portions of Upper Manhattan. I am the co-president with Graham Serralo, who kind of takes the lead on the 72nd. I take the lead on the 71st. Our district leader is uh, Robert Jackson, who should be in the attendees list somewhere. Um, also, I want to just state that, you know, today I was, it was a little bit shocking earlier watching the news. We, we saw once again, a district attorney choosing not to prosecute. So I, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring that to the forefront of this conversation today, because this is one of the reasons why the district attorney's race is so important, especially for um, communities of color across the country. So I'm looking forward to hearing your, your responses to questions this evening. It's been a pleasure working with my co uh, my co-uptown pol political leaders, um, Paula and Alec, on this on this very important topic. So thank you all once again for joining. I'll pass it to Alec. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Alec Barrett, and I'm one of the district leaders from Westside Democrats. Uh, we represent part of the 69th Assembly District and the 67th Assembly District, um, which means roughly from 100th Street on the west side all the way down to about 41st Street. Um, we were recently formed out of three uh, West Side clubs that have been had been around for a long time: Community Free Democrats, Ansonia Democrats, and uh, and Park River Independent Democrats. Um, we have a lot uh, going on this election season, including forums this week for candidates for council in the sixth and seventh council districts, and for New York City Comptroller and Manhattan Borough President. We'll post all the information in the um, in the chat. Uh, about how you can find out more. Um, I want to recognize our club president, Richard Oppenheimer, and my fellow district leaders, Joan Palo, Mark Landis, Janice Oppenheimer, Jason and Corey Haber, Josh Kinberg, and Georgette Gittens, um, who have contributed so much to uh, Westside Democrats. Um, I now would like to uh, have the honor of turning over um, our forum to our esteemed moderator, uh, Professor Brett Dignam is uh, Vice Dean and Professor of Criminal Law at Columbia Law School. Brett, thank you so much for being here with us this evening, and um, we're honored to have you lead this discussion with the DA candidates. Thank you. Thank you, Alec, and thanks to all the other organizers for doing this. I'm going to count on you to keep people honest about time. We have a lot of ground to cover tonight. There are very many of you. We want to hear from you. So the organizers have actually randomized your name. So I'll be calling on you in different orders for each of the questions. These were computer generated. We're gonna get started right away. I understand you know that you're gonna have three minutes to introduce yourselves. And I'd like to call on Ms. Orleans first to do that. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Eliza Orleans and I'm the only public defender running for Manhattan District Attorney. And this evening I'll make the case for why being the only public defender in the race makes me the most qualified candidate to serve as Manhattan District Attorney. Most of the candidates you're hearing from today are former prosecutors with more than six decades of prosecutorial experience between them. And I think some of them are proud of that. Some think that experience makes them more qualified than a public defender like me to serve as Manhattan District Attorney, but I disagree. And I would implore all of you who are listening to think about what it really means to have prosecutorial experience in the United States, to have played such an active role in a system this unjust and cruel, to have held a position of power in an organization while it rampantly violated human rights and human dignity. What prosecutors do every day to the people like the people that I represent is cruel, inhumane, and plainly wrong. And like so many other things in this country, it's taken far too long to acknowledge that. But I think the question we have to ask our ourselves is can we trust someone to change a system in which they were complicit? And can we trust a person 
to make these reforms that are so desperately needed to people who were most directly responsible for the injustice. It's public defenders, not former prosecutors, who have the experience we need, the demonstrated commitment to honestly acknowledging the problems and trying to fix them. I've spent my entire career going up, going up against Cy Vance's office in court, and I've represented thousands of people charged with crimes, as many as 180 clients at the same time. And for every human being I've represented, I've had to manage countless moving parts, from making strategic decisions and interviewing witnesses to leading teams of investigators, social workers, and experts, all without ever losing sight of the unique stories, circumstances, and human beings at the heart of each case. Prosecutors make decisions that have devastating impacts on people's lives. And it's public defenders who are there to pick up the pieces, who advocate for restorative justice and rehabilitation and work every day to break the cycle and change the system. And that is precisely the experience we need because taking over for Cy Vance is just the first step. After that, the real work begins. So the next Manhattan DA must be someone who will fight who brings a real sense of urgency to the job and who understands what is at stake. Simply having a vision for changing the office, even if it's bold and progressive, is not enough. The next DA must have the will and be prepared to lead and make changes from day one. And I'm talking about real transformational change and moving to the right side of history. This is so long overdue and we have no time to waste. When Cy Vance ran, even he made promises that sounded good to progressives at the time, which were not kept. So we need someone with the experience to understand the implications of these policies in the real world, someone with the authentic commitment to transforming the system, ready to make bold systemic change. I am that person, I can do both. I hope you will join me in the fight and I would be honored to receive your endorsement. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Abushi, I'm gonna call on you next, please introduce yourself. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for hosting such an important forum. Uh, and I'm honored uh, at the opportunity to share my vision for a Manhattan District Attorney with all of you. My name is Tahania Bushi. I am a civil rights attorney. Uh, and for over a decade, I have fought against discrimination, racism, and the use of excessive force by police. I also represent children who are sexually assaulted. The fight for criminal justice reform is personal to me. When I was only 14 years old, my father was sentenced to 22 years in prison. Overnight, my mother became a single parent of 10 children. And that was the moment that my childhood ended. To see and live through the damage and destruction that the prosecution system causes never left me and inspired me to become an attorney. It inspired me to push back on our systems of authority that have worked to destabilize and destroy our communities. And that is why I have spent over 10 years pushing back on these systems and ensuring that people not only have their rights protected, but that these systems of authority cannot continue to abuse their power at the expense of our freedom. And when I started this campaign, I went to the impacted community, the community that I am from, and ensured that our policies and our platforms were informed by these very experiences. Because this is the fight that I'm going to take to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. I will make it transparent, accountable, and collaborative to the public. Because we are obligated to protect the rights of all of the constituents, not just the powerful and privileged. My goal as Manhattan District Attorney is to shrink its footprint. That means declining as many cases as possible resulting from societal failures like poverty, mental illness, substance use disorder, and sex work. That means decarcerating at every turn and taking the hundreds of thousands of dollars we spend tearing families apart and instead invest it back into the communities to address root causes of behaviors and take preventative measures. That means holding law enforcement accountable, especially when they come into our communities in Harlem, Washington Heights and Inwood to meet their quotas. We need to stop the criminalization of people of color who have been made to be the face of crime in this city while the powerful and privileged commit crimes with impunity. We need somebody with experience, not in complacency and conformity in the face of injustice. 
We need somebody that is going to do more than give us thoughts and prayers. Something more than investigations and agencies that are going to delay justice and look the other way. We need somebody who's different, somebody ready to hit the ground running, put people first and ensure that no bank account or badge is held above the law. I look forward to continuing my vision, sharing my vision with you and hope to earn your support as the next district attorney of Manhattan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Weinstein. Thank you all. Thank you all so much um, for hosting this important forum and for having me. Uh, and it's nice to be reunited with all of my fellow candidates after some time away. Uh, so I am an immigrant. I came to this country as a young girl to flee the violence and anti-Semitism of revolutionary Iran. And that remains the framework through which I see the world and through which I see the work. What do I mean by that? First, I know what it means to distrust your government. Second, I know that my parents brought me here to experience fairness and safety. And I never take those things for granted. I know that equal opportunity depends on fairness and safety. And third, when I see a barrier to access or to opportunity, whether it's a barrier for immigrants or a barrier for our black or Latino neighbors or for anybody, I feel like I want to take it down because I know what it's like to stand on the other side of a barrier, to stand on the other side of a border, and to want to be let in and to want to have the opportunity to thrive. With that starting point, I grew up to work across American legal institutions, although I can't, um, I can't resist saying that uh, Brett's husband uh, was my tax professor in law school. Um, maybe there'll be some tax questions tonight. I hope not. Uh, and, uh, you know, I went from there to work uh, in so many parts of our government, from the Supreme Court to the leadership of the U.S. Department of Justice with Attorney General Eric Holder, to being a federal prosecutor for six years, and then my last stop as the general counsel of the Brooklyn DA's office. And I want to pause there because that was the most formative experience in my vision for the Manhattan DA's office. First, I learned management of an office about the size of the Manhattan DA's office, whereas the general counsel, I both helped run the office and to put into motion DA Gonzalez's vision for criminal justice reform and for progressive prosecution. I built new institutions, including the first post-conviction justice bureau in the country and a new law enforcement accountability bureau. And I also understood from the experience there and from all of my other experiences uh, across these legal institutions that we have to rededicate ourselves to our core mission of safety, including curbing gun violence, stopping gender-based violence, and looking out for our most vulnerable. And that's what I hope to bring to the Manhattan DA's office. I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bragg. Thanks so much for having me tonight. When I was 15 years old, I was stopped by the NYPD at gunpoint, a gun put inches from my face, falsely accused of being a drug dealer. That was the first of many stops, three at gunpoint. I also had a gun pointed at me three times by people who were not police officers. These early experiences are why I went to law school and why for the past 20 plus years, I've been in the courtroom fighting for both civil rights and public safety. I left Harlem where I grew up and went to Harvard for college and law school and came right back to Harlem and Washington Heights and got to work. Started off as a civil rights lawyer and a criminal defense lawyer, became a federal prosecutor focused on public corruption and ultimately became the chief deputy attorney general of New York State overseeing the entire attorney general's office. You'll hear from a lot of great candidates tonight. Let me tell you why I should be DA. The first is we need up to bottom, top to bottom, culture change in the DA's office. And I'm the one with the most management experience, having overseen an office of 1,200 and worked on both public safety issues and civil rights issues, leading our team that worked on gun interdiction, stopping guns flowing into the state, leading our team that worked on stop and frisk and helping to end that practice. I'm ready on day one to manage this office and bring culture change that will focus on the trauma of sexual assault survivors uh, and also bring real police accountability. Second, this office is fundamentally about case making, and I have the most case making experience of the kind of cases we need. Let's start with Trump. 
The next DA is going to inherit that investigation. I follow the facts wherever they've gone throughout my career, indicting and prosecuting an FBI agent, uh, helping convict the former majority leader of the state Senate for bribery, and yes, holding Trump accountable for his misconduct with the Trump Foundation and suing him over 100 times at the Attorney General's office for his programmatic uh, missteps as president. I'm ready to do that on day one. I'm also to use the levers of government power to stand up for tenants who've been harassed by landlords and for workers who've been cheated out of their wages. And equally as important as the cases I have not done. Unlike others who have some prosecution experience, I've only tried one misdemeanor case, and that was of two men who blocked the Planned Parenthood facility and didn't let staff and patients in. The third and maybe the most important reason is all this work is personal for me. I've lived it. I grew up in Harlem in the 80s. I've seen about everything the criminal justice system has. When I think about police accountability or my representation of Eric Garmer and his family now, I think about the times when I was stopped as a youth. When I think about prison conditions and reentry, I think about my brother-in-law who lived with me for a year plus after he was incarcerated in solitary confinement. When I think about public safety, I think about when I had a semi-automatic weapon put in my head, a knife at my throat and a homicide victim on my doorstep. That's my life. I think now mostly about my two children, raising them in Harlem. Different, different, things are not different so much so from when I grew up. They're facing the same challenges and I have the same conversations with them. And I will talk to them about the non-prosecution today of another unarmed black person. I'm proud to have the support of Robert Jackson, Congressman Rangel and C. Virginia Fields. This is my life, this is my life's work. I look forward to earning your support as well. Thank you. Ms. Crotty. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and tell you about myself. Um, my name is Liz Crotty, I'm currently a defense attorney and I wanna be your next Manhattan DA. I'm born, raised and educated here in Manhattan. My 20 years of experience in 100 Center Street has been on both sides of the criminal courtroom. I was a Manhattan DA for six years and I started my own criminal defense law practice 13 years ago. I believe I believe going forward, Manhattan needs a district attorney's office that balances the need for public safety and practical reform. We should not have to choose between safety and civil rights. I have the right experience and perspective to lead this office. I have done close to 4,000 cases, both as a prosecutor and then uh, about 1,000 as a prosecutor and a little and the rest as a defense attorney. This, my, this has been my career um, what I know and what I come to bring to this job has been learned over time. It has not been taught, it's not academic, and it's not from the supervisor's office. It is representing people every day in the trenches. I think that is what brings a unique perspective to this office. I think we need to have practical solutions, common sense, and work to public safety so that we can all live here together Coronavirus has been a very, very difficult time. The city is facing new challenges and I think I'm the right person for the job. I appreciate your time tonight and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you. Mr. Port. Yes, good evening and thank you, Professor, and thank you to the district leaders, club presidents for inviting us tonight. Um, my favorite book about the criminal legal system uh, has very little to do with being a lawyer or the law. Uh, Jill Lovey, an LA Times reporter, uh, wrote a book called Ghetto Suck. It talked about the mortality rate of black men and black boys in South Central Los Angeles. Ironically, when Bill Bratton was police commissioner there before he came back to be police commissioner in Manhattan. And there's a line in the book um, that Jill Lovey talks about, the response by police departments and prosecutors to crime, rampant crime throughout South Central Los Angeles. And it is this, it is that the law is a bully against that which is hard, but a coward, uh, excuse me, that the law is a bully against that which is easy, but a coward against that which is hard. Nothing sums up the last 11 years under Cy Vance more so than that statement. A bully against that which uh, he should not have prosecuted and a coward against that which he should have. And I'm running to be district attorney through my experience in the courtroom, through my experience in the legislature, to do three things, not to do the small thing, not to be a different type of prosecutor, um, to do the small type of reforms, but to really rebuild this office from the ground up. And I'll do that in three very specific ways. First, I'm the first candidate who came out with a detailed nine point policy plan on how I re revamped the sex crimes unit within the office. 
that will be one of my top priorities. Nothing is more important than gaining the trust back of Manhattanites on how to reform the sex crimes unit within the office. Second, end the surveillance-based technology. This is an important issue in this race, a point of distinction between the candidates about so-called gang prosecutions. Many of the prosecutors and many of the candidates in this race believe this is a tool that they themselves can use more wisely because they are a better person or a better district attorney than Cy Vance. I reject that notion. It is the tool itself that is wrong. And it is the tool itself that has racially disproportionate outcomes. I won't use it. And last, the thing I'm most synonymous with in Albany, ending all sorts of policies that punish poverty with no public safety benefit. From bail reform to gravity knife reform, I have been at the forefront of every important effort over the last 10 years to reform our criminal legal system. It is those three issues that I'm running on and many others and a point of distinction between myself and the other lawyers in this race and why I wanna be your next district attorney. Thank you, Mr. Quart. I've had a request from somebody who's listening that you please identify your affiliation. In due course, when you're answering a question, if you could do that for us, that would be extremely helpful. Ms. Lang. Thank you so much to all the clubs who've convened us tonight. I'm Lucy Lang, and I'm so thrilled to be here with you to talk about these critically important issues that are facing our city. I know that the Office of the District Attorney is about far more than prosecution alone. The next district attorney must take a 360 degree view of the system and everyone it touches. And I know this as a national criminal justice reform leader and as a former assistant district attorney here in Manhattan. I know that the urgency of ending mass incarceration must be a stated priority for the next district attorney. And that includes addressing the unconscionable racial disparities that persist in our system. It are, it's the urgency of that mandate that led me to create a first of its kind college and prison program that brings assistant district attorneys inside New York state prisons to work alongside incarcerated community members to develop ideas for change together and to change policy so that the people who operate the system can come to understand the people who are subject to it. It's also why I have been a leading advocate for ending the dehumanizing practice of stripping people of their right to vote while they're incarcerated. Imagine how different our system would look if people seeking to lead the system had to go inside prisons and advocate for them, their positions and learn from their constituents behind bars. My community work is why I'm honored to have been endorsed by families who lost loved ones to police violence, including Valerie Bell, Sean Bell's mother, Victoria Davis, Delron Small's sister, Valerie Castile, Philando Castile's mother, for our work together to develop a set of protocols for how prosecutors can ensure accountability in instances of police brutality and misconduct. I'm also honored to have been endorsed by brave survivors of sexual abuse by Harvey Weinstein, alongside whom I created a plan for a revamped sex crimes unit that is trauma-informed, that incorporates clinicians, and that puts survivors' needs first. I have also developed a plan for addressing racial justice and injustice within the office that is informed by my work alongside incarcerated New Yorkers. And that includes declining to prosecute cases that don't belong in the system, diverting cases that belong in public health system, crimes of poverty, crimes of mental health challenge and substance misuse and ultimately ending the reliance on mandatory minimums, on three strikes laws and draconian laws that result in unduly long sentences that serve no one and undermine public safety. I know how to change the system because I've worked to change it from inside and out and I'm committed to a district attorney's office that prioritizes prevention, equity and the dignity of all New Yorkers. I would be so honored by your endorsement and look forward to working alongside you. Thank you, Ms. Lang. Last but not least, Ms. Florence, it's your turn. Thank you. Hi, my name is Diana Florence and I'm running for Manhattan DA to fight for the people who never thought they'd win. It's in my DNA. 
As the only sibling of David who is autistic and does not speak, I have used my voice to advocate for my brother my entire life. And it's what I continue to do as the leader of the Construction Fraud Task Force, where I champion people every day without a voice. I created a community-based model of prosecution that was replicated nationwide, managing scores of investigators, lawyers, and analysts to go after crimes of power, like wage theft and corruption, instead of targeting crimes of poverty. I spent my career fighting for justice for people like Carlos Moncayo, who was a 22-year-old carpenter when he was buried alive in a 14-foot unprotected trench in the middle of a multi-million dollar construction site. I got justice for Carlos, and I also went after companies that stole from workers and killed their employees on the job people that have used their domestic partners. And I targeted big real estate and slumlords that rip off tenants and harass them out of their homes. That's exactly what your DA is supposed to be doing. And it's the very least we should expect from our DA. But for too long, the current DA has done the opposite over-criminalizing people of color while giving a pass to Weinstein, Epstein and Trump and many other lower profile powerful people only reversing course when publicly exposed. Imagine what the world would have looked like if the current DA had used his power to do justice for all New Yorkers. Going after corruption really matters. It not only ensures real consequences for those who cheat, it replenishes our tax coffers, which will allow us to reinvest in communities that have been long hurt by the justice system, fund our failing schools, crumbling housing and healthcare systems. Who your DA is really matters. Earning trust in government starts with transforming that criminal justice system. We must hold police accountable who abuse their position to kill and injure. And we don't have to rely in assembly line justice where we robotically process people without regard to their realities. We can use an individual and holistic approach to every case, whether violent and nonviolent, and we can take into account both the needs of the survivor and the accused and craft outcomes that address underlying traumas and make us safer. I am so proud to have the support from over a dozen labor unions. These are bus drivers and sanitation workers, carpenters, hundreds of thousands of everyday people who know that no one in this race has my record of standing up to power consistently and winning. Together, we can make the district attorney's office a place of opportunity and not obstacle. And as your DA, I will do this alongside the community I serve, not in spite of it to ensure that every New Yorker is safe at home, safe at work, and safe on the street. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Florence. We're now going to segue into the part of the forum where you're going to answer questions. You have a very short period of time. I'm going to announce each question in advance, and then I'm going to call on you individually. Except, Ms. Abushi, I'm going to warn you that you are first up for the first question. And the first question is, as DA, would you develop policies to increase the use of alternatives to incarceration and diversion from detention? If so, what would they be? Thank you so much, um, Professor. Is how many how many how much time do I have to answer? It's one minute. Curtis has held up two minutes, but I actually thought it was one. We're going to get more questions if you can limit it to one. We're getting a lot questions. Very well. Um, we cannot achieve justice unless we shrink the footprint of this office. And that means ensuring that alternatives to incarceration are offered across the board and are made available to our communities regardless of the circumstances. Uh, and so, yes, we will have a policy and we'll, we, we will be rolling out a policy um, this week elaborating more on our efforts to shrink the footprint of the office rely instead on community-based organizations that will help us prevent future crimes and address the current circumstances. And again, move these out of the prosecutor's domain, uh, which just serve to um, 
punish people who are struggling or who need the time to rectify their behavior and often impose uh, financial burdens by forcing them to pay to classes uh, with really no measurements of success. So I think alternatives to incarceration uh, will be a priority. They need to be a priority um, to address current harm and prevent future harm from happening. Thank you very much, Ms. Abushi. You're welcome. Ms. Merlin, uh, please, your thoughts on alternatives to incarceration and diversion. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Did you call on me? I did, sorry. Sure. Um, so again, Eliza Orleans, public defender. A handful of years ago, I represented a young woman. Her name was Jessica, a teenager who was charged with gun possession. And despite our pleas for mercy, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office wanted only to see this young woman in jail. They refused to offer an alternative to incarceration. And finally, a judge agreed to let Jessica participate in an ATI, alternative to incarceration. And she excelled in the program and successfully completed it. And two years later, I was so proud of her. And she asked me to speak at her high school graduation along with the judge on the case. She's now gainfully employed, engaged, and has a baby on the way. And that case, along with so many others I've represented as a public defender, have taught me that even for serious issues, we must be thinking beyond just punitive prison sentences. Alternatives to incarceration are the most important thing. And as district attorney, they will be the default. They will be the rule rather than the exception as they have been under the current Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Orleans. Ms. Florence, you're up next. Thank you. I also agree that alternatives to incarceration are very important, particularly in cases where youth are involved. And that's why I'll be proposing a young adult bureau, which will center uh, cases involving youth between 17 and 25. And that will be what we will use. But it's important to think about when we think about diversion, we think we need to think about the types of cases and involve the survivors in that discussion. And when we bring up alternatives to incarceration, we need to make sure that they are commensurate with the crimes. So when we do this, we need to make sure that it, it addresses the harm caused. And, and that should be especially with the alternatives to incarceration with crimes of poverty, where I believe that they need to be diverted. So we need to make sure that alternatives are em employed wherever possible, but incarceration must be used in very serious cases. Thank you, Ms. Florence. Mr. Bragg, your thoughts on alternatives and diversion? Incarceration would be a matter of last resort under my leadership. I, I know about this firsthand. I spoke about my brother-in-law. He was prosecuted for a gun that he never touched and didn't even know uh, was on his friend for a schoolyard fight that if he were at uh, uh, any other school in the country, uh, uh, that he would have not been prosecuted for, but he was at a historically black college that was over-policed. Uh, and he was not uh, given an opportunity to have an alternative incarceration. Instead, was incarcerated, spent time in solitary confinement, and I saw the output of that. So I know firsthand the importance of these programs, uh, and I know how to design them. And going back to the management point, the, the DA's office has an ATI program. It's not integrated. We need culture change in the office where we have the training and the focal point so that every assistant district attorney is thinking about cases and thinking about that as a part of the menu of the options integrated into the DNA of the office. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bragg. Mr. Quart, you're up next. Thank you. Um, diversion practices are appropriate in many circumstances, but we should be honest, they're not a panacea and we shouldn't sell this to the public as, as it were a panacea because it's not. In many cases, simply declining to prosecute using the social workers within the office to liaison with the not-for-profit providers is often going to be the better result rather than any diversion practice with the footprint of the courtroom and the top charge hovering over a person. And I understand this firsthand. For the last three plus years, I've been doing public defense work in Manhattan criminal court representing poor people. And I've seen the uselessness, the waste of certain programs. Yeah, there's some good programs, the stop lift program, but there are also some wasteful programs for pedicab drivers who uh, uh, allegedly do something wrong, or for someone selling a video cassette and steps one foot out of the demarcated area, they have to do a quality of life program. These are useless diversion programs, and I will not invest district attorney funds in programs like that. Thank you, Mr. Quart. Uh, Ms. Crotty. 
Yeah, as, as Mr. Bragg was saying, alternative to incarceration programs already exist. I've had a lot of clients go through them. Um, I think that the thing that has to change about them is that they have to be a little bit more elastic to actually fit the needs of the defendant. I've had a client get into mental health treatment court. There's about five or six different things you have to do even to qualify. And then once you get into mental health treatment court, you know, they keep you there for two years, regardless of whether you need to keep coming up for updates or not. So I think alternatives to incarceration are good. I think they should be used. But I also think there's some violent crime. I think that there's sometimes alternatives to incarceration sometimes are not always the answer that they want to be. And I think we have to face the reality that not everybody wants an alternative to incarceration. They don't work for it. Actions have to have consequences, not necessarily incarceration. And I think alternatives to incarceration are a good tool. But I also think that sometimes there's harder decisions that prosecutors actually have to make about when and how to use these programs. Thank you very much, Ms. Crotty. Ms. Weinstein, your turn. The answer is yes, of course. In Brooklyn, our first principle was that incarceration should be a last resort. And I think alternatives have to have two features. First, they have to be diverse, an array of them has to exist to be specific to the type of crime uh, and to the defendant. And second, we have to be rigorous and uh, data-driven in measuring whether using these programs actually advance rather than detract from public safety. And we designed and built up many of these programs in Brooklyn. I'll tell you just about one, uh, which is an alternative, alternative program, a diversion program for people who possessed, young people who possessed a gun for the first time, and this was almost always young men of color, and we had social workers identify good candidates for this program in which they would agree to go through a rigorous two, one and a half to two year program that involved job training, mental health treatment, other kinds of therapy, at the end of which charges could be dismissed and rather than go to prison for three to five years and come back hardened and possibly more dangerous to the community, we thought that this was a way to advance public safety. Thank you, Ms. Weinstein. Ms. Lang. Professor, the words themselves reflect the fact that we are thinking about this problem wrong. There should be no alternatives to incarceration. That suggests that incarceration is the default, which we know that it has been. We should really think about this, and I've written about, I wrote about this years ago in The Hill. We should think about it as responsive sentencing. What is an appropriate sentence that responds to the harm that was caused and that addresses the perspective of the person who was harmed and seeks to heal whatever happened that, that led to someone perpetrating the crime? So I would reframe the entirety of the trial division to be about responsive sentencing. And I think that has to include a very important restorative justice component, which of course is not appropriate in every case, but I have witnessed it be incredibly impactful in even the most violent cases. And that has a better long-term outcome. And finally, I think that prosecutors have an obligation in cases that, where prison is used as a last resort to advocate for drastic conditions reform because the conditions of New York state prisons are not returning people back to our communities any better off. And it is on prosecutors to work with others to solve that. Thank you, Ms. Lang. We're now gonna go on to the second question and Ms. Lang, I'm gonna warn you that you're the first one up on this one. Um, so there've been several questions in the chat about violent crimes and people who commit violent crimes. I'd like you all to think about this as we go to the next few questions. On the back end, for people who do go to prison as they're coming out, what are your policy or programmatic plans to address the needs of the people leaving prison and the needs of the communities they will re-enter? I spent several years teaching in New York's re-entry facility, Queensboro, that many incarcerated New Yorkers go through on their way home to New York City. And I witnessed firsthand the incredible failures of re-entry in this city. So amongst the things that I'm committed to as a matter of re-entry, and I'm taking the back end part because this is part of the question, although there are really important front end pieces as well, it includes advocating for people to be released when they conclude the, the first part of their determinate sentence. It includes ensuring that people are put in facilities that, uh, that have some of the resources available that folks need, that people are put in facilities that are close to home wherever possible. It means removing the ban on returning home to NYCHA so that people can live uh, at home with their families where it's appropriate. And it means supporting people by developing wraparound services in collaboration with all of New York's rich community-based organizations 
to try to provide supports to people during that incredibly vulnerable time of the first few months home from prison. And that should be part of the district attorney's mandate. Thank you very much, Ms. Lang. Mr. Bragg, same question. First thing we need to do is be much more active about uh, parole as, as prosecutors uh, sign onto the Less Is More Act and not uh, perpetuate the system of violating people when they come home for technical violations. That's the first thing, do no harm. The second is uh, being very proactive about employment uh, supports and housing supports. I know this through my brother-in-law who I mentioned. I also know for, through my professional work at the attorney general's office, we enforce the state's uh, reentry law, uh, which prohibits reflexive discrimination against folks coming home based on uh, conviction status. We investigated and held accountable Party City, Bed Bath and Beyond and so many others. So I've policed this space before and that's what we need from a district attorney. One who will use the DA's forfeiture funds to do programming that will provide employment and housing supports. And we'll look at a case that's not done with a plea or a trial conviction, but one that ends with successful reentry and supports people and communities uh, through their lives. Thank you very much, Mr. Bragg. Next up, Ms. Orleans. Just like our criminal legal system, our reentry system is not broken. It's working exactly as designed to continue to marginalize and hurt are most marginalized New Yorkers, black and brown New Yorkers, lower income folks, people suffering from mental health issues and substance use disorder, and those who cannot afford to say, you know, have the appropriate mental health services or to afford an apartment um, that they're able to be in. Um, the, the most important thing we can do is support people who are re-entering citizens. But what the current Manhattan District Attorney's Office doesn't even get that far because what they do is they have a form letter that they send. And on every case that I ever had, I've seen this letter. It says the Manhattan District Attorney's Office strongly opposes the early release of, and then fill in my client's name there. And that will be a categorical, I will oppose that. I will end that practice because that is not just. And what we need to be doing is making sure that people are able to return to their families and we need to stop ripping families apart. You know, people talk about the family separation policy that Trump enacted at our Southern border, but your own Manhattan district attorney has a family separation policy and we must end that immediately. Thank you, Ms. Orleans. Ms. Florence. Thank you. You know, the problem with re-entry is that it's thought about way too late. When we think about it, when someone is about to exit, that's going to increase their chances that they're going to go back to prison. And that's exactly what we don't want. My proposal proposes pre-entry. We think about the end at the beginning of the case. And that means partnering with college programs like the Bard College Program or like Local 79, who I'm so proud to have as an endorse me. Barry Smith, who runs 100 Black Men in Construction, is part of this incredible program that mentors youth and, and works with Pathways to Apprenticeship to give people, when they come out of prison, they work with justice-impacted people, not only jobs, but pathways to careers and good housing. That's the way we break the cycle, and I'm proud to partner with that. Thank you very much, Ms. Florence. Ms. Abushi. You know, I think what's missing from this conversation is that it's very difficult, uh, if nearly impossible, to expect growth in a place like prison that is inherently unsanitary and violent. My father um, served 20 years, and I spent the last 20 years visiting him in prisons across the East Coast. And he came home after having triple bypass surgery at the age of 60 with nothing. And we know that when you incarcerate one person, you incarcerate an entire family and an entire community. And so a majority of the people who are processed through the district attorney's office shouldn't be there in the first place. And so those who, so the most important thing is to not break people and then spend even more money trying to build them back up. For those that unfortunately do uh, become incarcerated and are processed through the system, um, I will look towards expunging their record upon release because we can't guarantee uh, that there won't be discrimination when they apply for jobs. We can't guarantee that they won't be discriminated in housing, especially NYCHA housing when they go to apply. Once they're out of the prosecution system, we have no safeguards against the legalized discrimination 
that people of color will suffer once they do integrate. I want to also say as someone that has been endorsed by over a dozen, over half a dozen NYCHA resident council presidents, it falls on us community leaders to figure out how to make families whole again, how to reinvest in these communities. So we have to stop breaking people um, and spending more money to build them back up. All right, but we're going to have to move on. Mr. Quart, your turn. Thank you. A very important question. I think we have to understand, and I do from a supporter of mine, her name is Evie Litwak. Um, she was incarcerated. And what I learned from Evie uh, was that the trauma for those who are recent released, it's not months, it's years. So we need programs that reflect that fact, that trauma, uh, that housing and food instability and inability to get jobs uh, last years. And we have to have programs in place that it can, can accomplish that. At the state level, uh, that includes uh, re drastic reductions of the parole system, which I'm supportive of. But here back uh, in Manhattan, what really has to happen is we have to stop with the pretense that forfeiture funds is some panacea and a perfect answer to all the problems of reentry. It can be helpful with specific programs that can be funded, but ultimately the solution on housing stability, reentry into the workforce is going to be through the not-for-profit providers, through the city budget, through aid to municipalities, through the state budget that can actually fund the programs that will make the difference for those who are recently, re, recently released. The DA's office can partner with that, but it cannot take the lead. That is a city budget issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Court. Ms. Weinstein. Thank you. The, the district attorney's mission is public safety. And as part of that mission, the district attorney should both be an advocate for and an active participant in the safe return of people from prison back into their communities so that they can meaningfully contribute to their communities. And I think that we do this in a number of ways. First of all, through the office's own reentry programming, uh, which we did in Brooklyn. Second, through supporting community programs through the asset forfeiture funds. And third, in making sure that people really do have a second chance. And as part of the post-conviction Justice Bureau that I built, one of the things that we did was we facilitated and supported applications for sealing so that people at a certain point uh, can back, could come back to their communities without the burdens of a criminal conviction, uh, which can obviously interfere with housing, uh, with getting a job, uh, and with getting back on your feet. Thank you very much, Ms. Weinstein. Ms. Crotty. Yeah, I mean, your first part of your question was violent crime is rising. I think that has to be looked at and dealt with head on. I think it, when it comes to reentry, I, as so, someone who's been in probably the most jails as a defense attorney in the tri-state area, I understand firsthand what it's like to, to be in jails and what the conditions are in jails. And I do honestly believe that the conditions in jails have to be better. I think there has to have schools. And I think that with the Pell Grant for education is a way to go. But we, let's be clear, the district attorney's office doesn't, that's not their role. That, that is Department of Probation, that is Department of Parole. To the extent that the district attorney's office can help, I think that they should. But the, the role of the district attorney's office is to enforce the laws of the state of New York and, and then the judge sentences and not sentences. When you have reentry questions, I think you should look at a case-by-case -case basis on what that crime was and what, what the facts of each and every case was to see what the district attorney's position should be. But classically and historically, reentry is not part of the district attorney's office. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to the next question. And I'm going to tell Ms. Florence that you're going to be first up this time. And the question is, what is your management experience and philosophy and how will you evaluate and measure the success of your office and your assistant district attorneys? Could you hear me? Sorry, my volume cut out. It's about managerial skills. It's about your management experience and philosophy and how you will evaluate and measure the success of your office and the assistant district attorneys. Thank you so much. Thanks for repeating the question. Yes. I actually, my management experience is very deep. I created a first of its kind construction fraud task force, which involved managing not only lawyers and analysts within the office and investigators, but also spanned other agencies. In addition to that work, which I did for more than a decade, I also prosecuted thousands of cases. And these were not simple cases. These were, these were complex corruption cases spanning years and 
dealing with millions and millions of documents. So I understand the complexities of how to manage moving parts and, and in some ways herding cats. Um, my approach has always been very collaborative. Um, the best idea wins and we work together towards justice. It is about motivating and keeping people's morales up and always with the eye on fairness and equality and justice in the cases. That is what I did as a, as a prosecutor and that's what I will do as DA. Thank you, Ms. Florence. Ms. Abushi, management. Yes, so I think this is a monumental question and what we're talking about when we are looking for a future of Manhattan that's different is experience that is different. Um, like I said in my intro, we don't need the experience of decades of conformity and complacency in the face of injustice contributing to the very issues we are fighting to undo today. And I'm the only candidate that has taken on the NYPD, our fire department, our Department of Education to change harmful policies and practices that destabilized our community. And so to work with our different law enforcement agencies, to work with their executive um, teams, to make sure that we are doing better by New Yorkers is what we need in this office. And so in uh, coming into the district attorney's office, it's not a one woman show. I intend to have a collaborative body reflective of the impacted community, accused and victims alike that will help us bring to life our vision for a new Manhattan. Thank you, Ms. Abushi. Ms. Lang. Sorry, Ms. Lang. Sorry, audio error. Um, as the director of the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution, I worked with district attorneys across the country on operationalizing culture change and policies designed to end mass incarceration and reduce racial disparities. I worked with offices twice the size of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office to do things like analyze where it is in their case processing that they were uh, finding imbalances in, in racial justice administration. I have worked with, in, at the district attorney's office, worked across the office with all the, the 500 lawyers and 800 non-legal staff to try to bring in innovative programming, including building the first ever procedural justice program, including building, uh, bringing in trauma-informed best practices and trainings, and including developing the college and prison program that I described. On my website, I have laid out very clear ideas for how I intend to operationalize this culture change, including building a mission-aligned workforce, new legal training, and addressing these core issues that are so critical to management. Thank you, Ms. Lang. Next up, Ms. Orland. So as the only candidate who has spent my entire career going toe to toe with the, this DA's office in the courtroom and seeing the devastating effects of its culture of prosecutorial misconduct and mismanagement on a daily basis firsthand, I will come to that office with a clear understanding of what the stakes are for people's lives. And so when it comes to the, the real reforms and changing the culture of that office, a public defender is exactly who we need to enact them. And managing my caseload and all the hundreds of lives at stake in my hands, including the whole team, is my management experience. But the important thing about changing the culture and the measure of success of that office cannot be business as usual, cannot be the status quo. We have to stop electing career prosecutors to BDAs and start holding them accountable for perpetuating terrible wrongs and destroying families and communities. And I will know exactly which DAs who have been in this office for their entire career have been the ones to be the harshest um, and should be, you know, no longer uh, there when someone with my vision is in charge of that office. Thank you, Ms. Orleans. Ms. Crotty. Yeah, I, I come at this, I've started my own law firm 12 years ago. I run a small business. Um, I've been hired by 3,000 clients. It is definitely a micro to the district attorney's macro, but I've been dealing with client services now for, three, for, for 12 years, going on 13. I think you have to run an office where you, when I went to the DA's office under Mr. Morgenthau, he said the job was to do the right thing. And that's the job of, that's the job of the DA. And that's what I would tell all DAs. Your job is to do the right thing, not to get convictions, not stats, do the right thing. 
I think also too, when you, you have these offices, I think you cut your success, you, you rate your success by the rate of the office. I think the fact is if we can work on programs and help people to cut recidivism, that is the success rate. By keeping people from coming into the system and coming back to the system, that's your success. I think you do that by treating each and every case individually. I've been doing this for 13 years and I know how to run a business because I've been running a business for 13 years and it's a, it's a larger agency, but I know how to do it. Thank you, Ms. Crotty. Mr. Bragg. I know how to run a government office. I've run a division of 100 lawyers. I've stood up from scratch a statewide uh, unit uh, that worked on police accountability. And I oversaw an entire uh, office, the Attorney General's office, uh, staff of 1,200, 15 offices uh, statewide. My principal philosophy is to look at the whole person. Uh, I want to hire people looking at their whole backgrounds. So when I, my first hire for the statewide police accountability, unit was someone who was a homicide prosecutor with lots of experience and he had a master's in social work. I want to look at people holistically because I want them to look at everyone who comes before them, someone charged with a crime, a defense lawyer, the judge as whole people. Uh, I will promote not based on conviction rates, but on community engagement. I say that as a Sunday school teacher and a Harlem Little League coach, and no one has mentioned this. We've got to talk about diversity in this office. The office is woefully not diverse, and that's race, gender, survivors of crime, uh, social workers, and doctors, so we can follow the medical evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bragg. Mr. Quart. Yes, thank you. Um, I've been a practicing uh, attorney for 21 years, a partner at multiple law firms, not just litigating and trying cases myself, but managing the work of associates. I've also done criminal defense work uh, in Manhattan Criminal Court for the last three years and a state legislator representing parts of Midtown Manhattan and the Upper East Side for the past 10 years, uh, passing significant criminal legal reform in Albany. And I've done all three of those things uh, at different times at the same time, certainly demonstrating my ability uh, to multitask, if not tri-task. Um, the biggest issue here on culture change is to remember that it's policy and personnel changes that will make the difference in the office. Often it's uh, the delusion of first-time candidates who think just because they have a different vision that that can be implemented because they win a race. That's not how things work. I have, I have specific policies on different recruitment, retention, and significant change that goes beyond the leadership team. That's how we're gonna change the office with those type of policies, not simply with the winner of this primary who will likely be the next district attorney. It takes more than that. Thank you, Mr. Quart. Ms. Weinstein. Thank you. Not only have I supported the Attorney General of the United States when he managed the U.S. Department of Justice or managed my own cases and teams when I was a federal prosecutor, but I'm the only candidate in this race who has been part of the leadership of an office just like this one. As the General Counsel of the Brooklyn DA's office, I implemented, disseminated, and enforced new policies that apply to every single of our 500 plus ADAs in areas like discovery, parole, sentencing. I supervise multiple bureaus of the office, some of which I designed and created, including our appeals bureau, the post-conviction justice bureau, all of our civil litigation, our law enforcement accountability bureau. Uh, I think that to your second part of your question, there are lots of different ways of measuring success. One of them ought to be the confidence that people have in us. And one way to measure that is through reporting. So across the country, only half of incidents of domestic violence and sexual assault are even reported. Uh, we need to do better on that. And that would be a good measure of whether we have built a different office that is accessible to survivors in a different way. Thank you, Ms. Weinstein. We're moving on to the next question. I'd ask all of you to keep in mind that people listening to this are interested in your thoughts about violent crimes and the rights of victims. But this me, question- what, Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, moderator, we're gonna also switch to timekeepers. So just wanted to let that be publicly known to look at Alex for the time and not me. Thank you. Uh, so this question is, what role would you play? And I'm gonna flag that the person who gets to answer this first is Ms. Florence. What role would you play in advocacy and reform as a district attorney? And how would you balance those efforts with your prosecutorial and management responsibilities? Can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, my vision for the office is about re re flipping the narrative 
For too long, the office, which has not changed in 45 years, has focused most of its resources on crimes of poverty. And I will change that, where we will put attorneys to work on crimes of power. And that might be surprising to hear from someone who worked there for a long time, but I know precisely what is wrong with it. And because of that knowledge, I will be the most effective person to advocate for those types of reforms, changing that focus. When I talk about crimes of power, I am talking about gun trafficking and domestic violence, which I spent five years doing, sexual assault cases, gun trafficking, wage theft, housing fraud, human trafficking. These are cases that are have not had enough attention paid to them. And that's what we will do. I will partner with legislatures when there are loopholes to be closed. I wrote bills as chief of the construction fraud task force that is the way I will do reform. Thank you, Ms. Florence, and I apologize for making you go first twice. Ms. Crotty, your turn. I mean, I think that the role of the district attorney is to enforce the laws of the state of New York in a fair and just, equitable way. And I think that that is the, the first thing that the DA's office has to do. I mean, to, to balance that with advocacy and reform, it has to be done with a balance of public safety and how do we manage public safety and what is the voice of the victim? So I think that the, there's a lot of things that go into this. So I think in advocating, you are advocating for everyone and I, you're advocating for victims and you're ad advocating for defendants and there's also police officers, witnesses. I mean, I think that that is the role of the district attorney's office. And I think that that has always been the role of the district attorney's office is to balance advocacy, reform, and the responsibilities of the DA. And I think they've got to get better at doing it. But I don't think that, I think that that's been the job the whole time that we've been here. So that's what I think we have to, to, do, to do. Thank you, Ms. Crotty. Ms. Abushi. In <clears throat> changing Manhattan, the most important part is to make it transparent and accountable to the public. And you're never gonna achieve public safety without public participation. So we have to ensure that the community has a seat at the table. And advocacy and reform efforts go hand in hand with the policies district attorneys are going to set to change the culture and ideology of the office. And that means partnering with community-based organizations, hearing from impacted community members, victims and accused persons alike to understand how we can do things better, how we can address the systemic racism in the criminal justice system and prevent harm while focusing on centering people and healing, not just punishment and harm. Thank you, Ms. Abushi. Uh, Ms. Orleans, please. So I, I have to respectfully disagree with Ms. Crotty. I think that first of all, this has not always been the case and that the, pro the duty of a prosecutor is to seek justice, not to achieve outcomes. And for far too long, the Manhattan DA's office has valued convictions over justice and undermined the integrity of that office. And I do believe that we need to begin to build to rebuild public trust in that office and therefore the ethical obligations of prosecutors have to go well beyond the standards that they are currently held to. And so I think that, that the question asked regarding advocacy and reform and, and managing that office should all be one in the same. This has to be something that is that, that a holistic view is taken of because I think it will, you know, as the only public defender in this race and as someone who spent my career going up against this office, I believe I'm the most prepared of any candidate to implement policy in that particular area. I mean, I know that the, that current office, I've gone up against the bureau chiefs and deputies and ADAs. Um, and I know that simply, you know, re-interviewing them will not be sufficient to assess their conduct over the years. And so I think it's, it's very important to, to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Quart, please. Yes, uh, the Manhattan District Attorney is in a unique position to be an advocate both in City Hall with the mayor and the City Council, but most specifically in Albany, where I've served for the last 10 years. And I would respectfully suggest amongst the candidates, no one is in a, no one is in a better position to be an effective advocate for the office for justice than I am. I'll give you one example that came up today in the debate about expungement of records. Um, that is in fact not something the Manhattan DA can do on his or her own. That has to be an act of Albany. And I've been working with people in Albany on that very issue to expand the right of expungement, to go well beyond cannabis, to give hopefully me, the district attorney, the tools to make a significant change in people's lives by being be able to put the resources in place to not just seal records, 
but expunge records, misdemeanors and certain felonies. Nothing will improve the quality of life of so many thousands of people that Cy Vance has prosecuted and convicted over the last 11 years than successful legislation at the state level that expands the right of expungement and then advocacy by me as the DA actually executing on that law in Manhattan. Thank you, Mr. Court. Ms. Lang, please. The umbrella reform that the next district attorney must enact as quickly as possible that has never been done in Manhattan DA's office and has happened almost nowhere nationally is publishing case level, level data so that the public can see what is happening with cases and can cross-reference it with demographic data to do analysis and determine where there are inequities and hold prosecutors accountable for their campaign promises. And that's something that I'm committed to do from the very beginning. One way of ensuring that I'm held accountable is by building out advisory boards that include formerly incarcerated community members, LGBTQ plus community members, directly impacted community members of all kinds, and going out into the community and making sure that those folks are reviewing the data and determining whether or not it's consistent with what they want of their elected district attorney. The district attorney's office has a longstanding prohibition on involvement in community boards, which I would end. And I am also committed, and it's available on my website, to a set of performance metrics that are consistent with a mission-driven workforce. Thank you, Ms. Lang. Ms. Weinstein. Thank you. I think that both advocacy externally facing and reform what you do inside of the office are best served by experience. In terms of advocacy, I think it is the job of the district attorney to advocate for changes in legislation that help us to model fairness and deliver on safety. So for example, I was an advocate of new legislation that was more fair in terms of discovery that facilitated the search for truth in disclosing material earlier, much earlier, to the defense, but I was against the part of that legislation that requires prosecutors now to disclose victim and witness contact information very early because I think that that undermines public safety. In terms of reform, you know, when I teach criminal justice reform at NYU Law School, I always start by giving my students an article about why reform almost always fails in the corporate context. And it's not because the leader wasn't virtuous enough or she didn't have the best ideas. It's because she didn't know what she was doing. She didn't understand the institution, the bureaucracy. She didn't have the experience to actually translate ideas into action. Thank you, Ms. Weinstein. Mr. Bragg. So I want to I want to return to the, the, the thought of violent crime. I mean, I have stared into the eyes of a loved one after his best friend was shot and killed in front of him with the blood still on him. Uh, we need to be thinking about that. Uh, fundamentally, we can talk about transparency, yes. Data, transparency. We can talk about Albany, yes. But we need to be talking about uh, harm done to, to people. How do we redress that? And harm done to communities. What led to that conduct? Uh, harm people, harm people. Uh, I've lived through that. I've worked on cases involving violence, coming up with remedies for it. Uh, at the Attorney General's office, we pioneered a, a, a data-driven approach that tracks guns used at crime scenes to the last lawful sale. We need to be going to the core on prevention. What the brought the gun into Manhattan in the first place? That's what we did at the AG's office and that's what I would do in the DA's office. Thank you, Mr. Bragg. We're moving on to the next question and Mr. Court, I'm gonna tell you that you're gonna be first up. This one's short and direct. How would you respond to allegations of excessive force or other misconduct by the police? Well, if the, if the allegations are confirmed, I would prosecute. And I've said so that publicly. Uh, on May 9th, uh, on East 9th Street and Avenue D, Officer Garcia put his knee into the back shoulder and upper neck of Donnie Wright. By the grace of God, Donnie Wright wasn't killed. It, it was, uh, he, luckily enough, Officer Garcia was put on uh, desk duty, uh, but he was still getting paid. His pension benefits paid by you, the taxpayer. He resigned before administrative uh, trial could ever happen. Uh, the fact that Officer Garcia or similar circumstances, another officer who did the same thing resigned, that wouldn't change the fact. I would prosecute that individual. You see, there's a single standard of justice, or there will be if I'm district attorney. This idea that the NYPD or police officers are a protected class of people, that's not enshrined in our state constitution or state law. That is a political uh, immunity that we grant to them. It won't exist if I'm DA. 
When officers engage in lying, file false instruments, file false police reports, or engage in violent acts, I'll prosecute them. Thank you, Mr. Quart. Ms. Lang, same question. From the first day of my campaign, I have had a plan on my website for addressing officer accountability. And it was built in collaboration with families who lost loved ones to police violence. One of the district attorney's most important jobs is ensuring that everyone is held accountable for harming the community. And that has to extend to police officers. That includes being transparent about what has happened and where an investigation stands, communicating effectively and in a trauma-informed way, not just with families who lose a loved one, but also with communities writ large. And that extends beyond just cases of fatalities and brutality, but to misconduct in general. And so I'm also committed to building up uh, tracking systems for officers who cannot be relied on, whose arrests should not be pursued because of adverse credibility findings or other things that undermine the integrity of, of their casework. So I am deeply committed, thanks to my work alongside families who lost loved ones, to ensuring police accountability. Thank you, Ms. Lang. Ms. Weinstein. Thank you. Uh Everyone is equal under the law, no matter what uniform you wear, what badge you have, what office you occupy. And uh, I follow the facts wherever they may lead. And if there's a case to be made, I would make it. I would prosecute the things that you mentioned. I do want to add that um, when we ran the Law Enforcement Accountability Bureau in Brooklyn, uh, one of the things that I thought was particularly important to enforce were things like false statements or lying under oath uh, when committed by police officers, just like anybody else. Uh, because I think that those crimes have the effect cumulatively of undermining trust in the criminal justice system uh, in a way that hurts all of us and that undermines public safety. Thank you, Ms. Weinstein. Ms. Florence. You know, for too long, the only way police were held accountable was after a viral social media video. We saw that this summer, and that is not the way that we hold police uh, to the same standards as everyone else. That's why I proposed on my website a police accountability unit, which is fully independent. And I conceived of my ideas alongside a former CCRB employee. And within, in that consultation, we talk about partnering with the CCRB because let's face it, people don't come to the DA or police uh, directly to complain about corruption or brutality. So we need to get the information, cutting out the middleman of the police if they, get, if they get it at all. And we need to investigate and then be transparent about what we do. We also need to use 50A. We can do these cases proactively. It's how I did my work as an investigative prosecutor in corruption. We looked for patterns. We can use the declassification of 50A to find those, those patterns amongst corrupt police officers. Thank you, Ms. Florence. Ms. Crotty. I mean, I, I would echo what Ms. Weinstein said and say, listen, you have to follow the facts in every case. And I think the facts of every case should dictate what happens. I think excessive force, you have to look at the parameters of the ex excessive force. I think police officers have to be account held accountable just as anybody else. But at the same time, too, I think that you have to look at, you know, knowing the system is part of it. Uh, one of the things I like to talk about sometimes is, you know, you know, whenever the, the district attorney's office charges uh, obstruction of government in, in administration and resisting arrest, that's code for they, they, they upset the police officer. I mean, the, these are the things that people do and, and how the, the system works that I know after 20 years of working in in and on both sides of the courtroom of what police do and how they do it. I think knowing what police do, I mean, also too, I represented a police officer who was charged with a forgery. And you know what, no matter what happened at the end of that case, she was getting fired. Because if somebody has been accused of lying, the police, off the police force gets rid of those police officers because you can't have so a police officer who is lying. Buddy. Mr. Bragg. I've been doing this work for 20 plus years. Let me just start there. I'm representing Eric Garner and his family suing the city for transparency. And I can say that there's a police officer on the force that we're litigating about who the NYPD has said lied about force for Mr. Garner and he's still on the force. So we have lots of work to do. I started my career off, my face, first case was suing the state police on behalf of members of the Onondaga Nation for excessive force. 
Uh, I've prosecuted an FBI agent for lying. I've prosecuted a sitting district attorney who tried to allegedly, we allege, tank a case of an officer charged with uh, shooting an unarmed black motorist. So I've done this work uh, from the beginning of my career right up to the present, uh, including today where I was working on the case concerning Mr. Garner. Uh, this is a utmost priority for me and I think for our whole system because officers with badges who uh, do not do the job they're supposed to do and use excessive force or lie can erode the entire system and it undermines the administration of justice. So this is a top priority for me and I have the body of work to show it. Thank you, Mr. Bragg. Ms. Abushi. I think it's very concerning that I've heard the statement over and over by my colleagues that we will follow the facts wherever they may lead us, especially since Ms. Crotty has highlighted that a lot of the facts are skewed in favor uh, of evading accountability for an officer. Uh, and although a lot of my colleagues here could have held officers accountable when they had the opportunity, they didn't. And I'm the only candidate that has forced the prosecution of officers, um, those who have shot my clients in the face, planted evidence, uh, and intimidated witnesses. Um, and the reason why we are able to do that is because we collaborated with the public. And we're not going to be able to hold officers accountable without that public participation and helping us define what accountability looks like how to hold officers accountable into the same standard as everyone else, and more importantly, rein in the NYPD um, that has uh, drastically harmed and injured communities of color. Thank you, Ms. Abushi. Uh, and finally, Ms. Orleans. Perjury in the courthouse, falsifying documents, false arrests, and physical violence in the streets. Those are all types of police misconduct I saw routinely as a public defender including in the criminal courthouse and even when I raised it to people in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And these examples of chronic misconduct on the part of the police erode public trust and harm our communities. The current Manhattan DA's office, Cy Vance and his assistant district attorneys have been complicit in the continuing misconduct perpetrated by the NYPD. He has used his power to shield and protect police officers instead of holding them accountable. When I am Manhattan district attorney, police misconduct will simply never be tolerated. Upon assuming office, I will have a dedicated unit, which is specifically to prosecute police misconduct. And true accountability on the part of the police is what will make our city and our communities safer. And it is time to restore trust and integrity of the Manhattan DA's office. And that is what I will do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Orleans, and to all of you for being respectful of the time. The next question will be answered first by Ms. Weinstein. And the question is, what priorities would you establish among crimes or violations? And are there any felonies you would deprioritize? And I would ask each of you to be sensitive to the fact that we've had many comments asking about the recent increase in gun violence and homicide. And somewhere tonight, you should try to weave that into one of your answers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Brett. So that that is actually my starting point. I think that our very first priority in this job absolutely has to be gun violence. Uh, so we just closed a year in which gun violence doubled, uh, shootings doubled across New York City, uh, and murders went up 40%. Uh, and this is totally unacceptable. And uh, I have issued a, a robust 10-point plan that talks about the places where we do have to put our foot on the gas pedal in taking on gun violence. It's rooted in my experience in prosecuting gun crimes and prosecuting murder. And it includes gun trafficking, uh, where we have to work with our federal partners and uh, across jurisdictions jurisdictions with other states in order to stem the flow of guns into our city. Uh, it includes uh, prosecuting the possession of ghost guns, getting guns out of the hands of domestic abusers, and so on. And I will say I'm very proud to have the endorsement of Jackie Rowe Adams, uh, who is a hero in the fight against gun violence. Jackie lost two sons in separate incidents to gun violence. She has made this her life's work, and she is standing with me in this campaign because my priority is her priority. Thank, Thank you, you, Weinstein. Ms. Crotty. I think the priority, I mean, I've discussed this before. I mean, I think we have seen a rise in gun crime um, that correlates very closely to the police, NYPD, getting rid of anti-crime. Now, I understand that there were some problems with anti-crime. I'm not advocating for stop and frisk again, but you need to put anti-crime back on the street. What they did is there was an anti-crime unit in every precinct, and their job was to get guns off the street. I think that's what needs to be done. 
de blasio had a, his he had his fa fast track gun court from 2016 which mentions a lot of the same things as miss weinstein's gun policy plan and i think that those are good but basically what we have to do is stop it at its course and you have to stop it at its course by nypd going back on the street and making gun arrests. And I think that's what we need to do. And that's the priority of what we should be doing here and prosecuting these cases so that there's an actual deterrence for people not to have guns and that people realize if they do have a gun that they are going to go to jail. It worked before and it will work again. Thank you, Ms. Crotty. Mr. Quart. I, I think the question was about which felonies we would dis... That you would prioritize. And are there any particular felonies that you would prior give a lower priority to or a higher priority. You can look at it either direction. Yes, thank you for the um, drug possession and drug cases. And this is a significant problem in the great volume of cases within criminal court. Uh, you, too often they're mandatory minimums. We're gonna put in legislation in Albany in the next week or two, eliminating all these mandatory minimums. But there's so many drug crimes and their felonies on the books uh, penal law section 220 and different subsections that really have mandatory minimums, three years, eight years. And it's not just being applied to so-called drug kingpins. It's being applied to drug dealers. And I'm not going to prosecute that. I'm not going to spend your taxpayer dollars for three year, eight year uh, minimum sentences, millions of dollars to put drug dealers away in state, in state correctional facilities for that long a period of time. So I'm going to de-incentivize those lower down the charges, many to misdemeanors, um, which I think are appropriate uh, for this crime uh, of drug dealing. I'm not condoning dealing drugs, and I know it's something we have to address, but we do not have to address them with eight year, three year, five year sentences. Sorry, Ms. Lang, same question. I'm the only candidate in the race who has responded time and again to scenes of street homicide who has responded to hospitals and met mothers who've just lost their sons to street violence. Gun crime is at the core of why I'm running for district attorney. And I was the first candidate to propose a comprehensive gun plan that includes building a gun court specifically targeted to addressing the increase in gun violence that includes wraparound services for victims and that uses community-based interventions to prevent the cycle of gun violence. It's gonna include directing funding towards local community-based anti-violence organizations and incentivizing the use of responsive sentencing or what some people call ATIs. I will also focus on the increase in domestic violence and developing early interventions for kids who are so much more at risk during the pandemic as we're also seeing an increase and domestic violence, and I will prioritize sex crimes given the plan that I have worked on with the survivors of Harvey Weinstein, as well as emphasizing uh, white collar crime and the persistence of major economic crime in our city. Thank you, Ms. Lang. Ms. Florence. When a 16 year old picks up a gun, it doesn't happen out of nowhere. It's because he has no hope. And that is because he has been subjected to defunding of our schools, housing, and other essential services. So we need to attack guns before they get into our borders. And I will do gun trafficking cases because that's what I did as a prosecutor. Out of everyone on this panel, I have the depth of experience. I have done complex cases. I know how to bring them. But let's be clear. There is a direct connection between violent crime in this city and corruption, and we need to handle both of them. So that means going after wage theft. When someone can't pay, get paid, they don't have the ability to feed their family or pay their rent. We need to go after landlords that cheat. We need to go after employers that kill. These are my priorities, crimes of power. And you can read more about it on my website. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Florence. Uh, Ms. Abushi. We can't keep doing the same thing over and over and expect a different response. We have some of the harshest sentencing laws in the country. We incarcerate people at younger ages than any other jurisdiction. Um, we engage in mass incarceration and the mass criminalization, especially of communities of color. And even in the face of a pandemic, we're still talking about a rise in crime. So to respond with more policing and more prosecution is not only reckless, but it just shows that um, you know, you're not ready for a new vision of Manhattan. 
we have to partner with our community-based organizations. I'm the only candidate here that has gone into the neighborhoods, neighborhoods like mine in Harlem, and worked with our crisis management systems like Street Corner Resources um, and even Life Camp to make sure that we are getting to these communities, getting resources to the communities, and making them invested in avoiding these kind of traps. And so, yes, we need to invest resources to prevent these things before they become our gun problem. But even when they present themselves as our gun problem, we still need to extend resources and ensure that incarceration and prosecution is the very last resort, especially for our youth. Ms. Orleans. Yes, and I want to address deprioritizing drug felonies because the racist war on drugs is a war on people. And I've seen the way in which the criminalization of drugs has disproportionately hurt black, brown, low income and already marginalized communities. And I've seen how undercover police officers go up, pretend to be dope sick, go up to my clients who are themselves suffering from substance use disorder and beg, please man, help me out, help me out, hand over one pill of their own Xanax, their own methadone, you know, something out of their own stash. And then all of a sudden charged with felony sale of narcotics and facing years in state prison. That is not justice. That is not public safety. And that is something that we have to correct the failures of this war on drugs. Now, obviously, we also do have to address violent crime. And I promise I will get to it in the next answer because I, I want to talk about gun violence and I do have a plan. And if you go to elizaorlands.com slash end gun violence, I would encourage all of you to attend our event on Thursday night with Congressman Swalwell. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Orleans. Mr. Bragg. When I was a federal prosecutor, I prosecuted the owner of a $30 million business who laundered tens of millions of dollars for a violent uh, criminal enterprise. We need to be focusing on that type of case and not the types of cases that are sort of the in use, really the, the symptom of the problem than the problem itself. The folks who are standing far away from Manhattan some, some occasions and profiting off the pain of our communities. Uh, this is a model that I used in that case, which was significant you know, uh, uh, violence and drug trafficking. When I was at the Attorney General's office, we pioneered some of the work that others have talked about based on a portal that we designed uh, at the Attorney General's office to track uh, crime scene guns. Uh, I also lived in Harlem my entire life. I don't think anyone else uh, can say that here and have partnered with community groups since my birth. Uh, so I would partner with uh, for example, my Sunday school students, so I see they see the harm of this. I would partner with faith groups. I partner with other existing community groups I've worked with my entire life to amplify and complement the work that I'll do in the courtroom. Thank you, Mr. Bragg. And you're going to be first up on this next question, which is a little bit longer. Um, what would you do to better serve witnesses and complainants from vulnerable populations? And I've got lots of examples of what that might be, but I think you can imagine them who have not felt that they are treated seriously or respectfully by police and prosecutors. This is a significant issue. Um, the, the, the first thing is we need to be in the communities. You know, the, 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 the district attorney, quote unquote, opened an office in Washington Heights. Uh, I think it's empty. Uh, so we need to be in Harlem, in, in the Upper West Side, in Washington Heights. I would do that. I've been in the, these communities my entire life. People come forward uh, and trust the system when they're people they know and they trust. That's who I've been. I've been here for my entire life. We also need to think about creative solutions. Like I was talking to a survivor uh, of domestic violence the other day, and she was talking about the difficulty of going into the DA's office and sitting side by side with police officers and others hovering around. Uh, we, we need to have, look, at, look at having a separate place uh, for folks who've been marginalized, where it's difficult to come forward. We need to go to folks. Folks don't need to come down to one, one center street. We need to be in the communities so people can trust us and access us uh, in a fair, efficient, and just way. Thank you, Mr. Bragg. Ms. Orleans. So as a public defender, I investigated all of my cases and oftentimes I would go to someone's home, a witness or a complainant, and they would feel so unheard by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and they would invite me into their home. I would sit with them and hear their stories. And oftentimes my clients themselves were victims of crimes and I would accompany them. And truly the way in which we're handling or the way in which the Manhattan District Attorney's Office is handling witnesses and complainants is not serving them, is not serving the communities, is not serving anyone. All the system can do 
to help a, a, a victim or a survivor is go, you know, beat up the person who hurt them too. And that's not helping anyone. So I think what we need to do is have someone who is willing to listen, but also to address those things outside of the arm of the of law enforcement, you know, not having police and district attorneys around people and making sure that people are comfortable and heard and can can pursue cases um, to their comfort. But that also means protecting members of our immigrant communities and making sure ICE has absolutely no place in our courthouses. Thank you, Ms. Orleans. Ms. Lang. As a young assistant district attorney, I handled the case that came in as a domestic violence cross complaint where both parties were arrested. And over the course of a long investigation, it became clear that the woman had been being victimized by her live-in boyfriend for more than eight years, that he was beating her in places that were not visible, that he was waiting for her outside her work and garnishing her wages, that he was keeping her locked inside her apartment. And I only uncovered this because I asked her where she wanted to meet and what time worked for her, rather than asking her to come down to the district attorney's office or having the police bring her to me. And I, being an assistant district attorney is not a desk job and no one will perceive it as such under my administration. We'll build a workforce that goes out into the community that meets victims where they are, that is trauma informed. And of course, lawyers can't do it alone. We have to be informed by the expertise of clinicians and social workers. And I will invest in building out an interdisciplinary approach to supporting victims. And that will include ensuring that people have access to U visas so that they don't face risk of deportation and, and then communicating that with the community so that people know that the district attorney's office is there to serve everyone, especially vulnerable populations. Thank you, Ms. Lang. Uh, Ms. Weinstein. The answer is that we have to do everything we can and to constantly stretch to do new things to meet the needs of witnesses and complainants who are the most vulnerable. And I'll give you just one example. I spoke earlier about the fact that only half of incidents of domestic violence are even reported generally. Against that depressing backdrop, we noticed in Brooklyn that after ICE began its policy of arresting non-citizens in and around courthouses, so basically using state courthouses as bait, we saw a drop off in reporting from women who were not citizens, who were the survivors, victims of these crimes, because they were afraid to come forward. They were worried that they or someone they loved or a witness in their case would be subject to an ICE pickup and deportation. And so we did something that DA's offices never do. We joined forces with the Attorney General of the state to sue ICE over this policy and to say this policy is interfering with our ability to look out for the most vulnerable and to deliver on safety for the most vulnerable. And we won that case in federal court. We got an injunction prohibiting ICE from doing that. Thank you, Ms. Weinstein. Ms. Florence. You know, it's not so much about office space in the DA's office. There's plenty of places for victims to be separate and there's a family violence center, but really what the, it is about the approach. I did domestic violence for five years and I, I did cases innovatively. So I talked to witnesses, I talked to victims and when they didn't want to or couldn't testify, we found alternatives, other ways to hold the, um, the abuser accountable. Might've been through document crimes, using videos. There are many ways to do that. Those are those innovations I would, I would institute across the office. With respect to immigrants, I worked side by side with immigrants, especially they were most vulnerable to wage theft. And I instituted a policy of actively asking for preclusion, of asking about an immigration status when it comes to immigrant witnesses. That allowed them to have the comfort of knowing that their testimony on their behalf would not end up injuring them in their, in their status. Thank you, Ms. Florence. Mr. Court. Yes, thank you. Uh, the scarcity of witness cooperation um, can be directly linked and connected to the distrust of both the NYPD and the district attorney's office within communities of color without Manhattan, within Manhattan. I'll give you an example. Um, twice in the last three years, uh, I went to the TA Association meeting at Taft Houses, a NYCHA complex on 114th Street and Madison Avenue. And at the beginning of the meeting, you had the NYPD community police officers talking about arrest and what's going on in the neighborhood. But in the middle of the meeting, myself with Legal Aid Society, lawyers and advocates, were talking about how both the NYPD and Cy Vance's office profiles communities of color through their gang database list and other spreadsheets and technology they keep. You see, communities hear both those things. They hear the community policing, but they also hear that they're being profiled in a very distrustful and dishonest way. And we cannot expect under that system, under that, uh, under that level 
uh, of government, by law enforcement, that we're going to get witness cooperation or buy-in by the community. That has to change. And that's why I've made that point a central part of my campaign. Thank you, Mr. Court. Ms. Abushi? I've spent the last decade in people's living rooms across this city fighting to have their voices heard, including victims of crimes and sexual assault. And I've had to fight to have police officers take reports or district attorneys take their cases serious and even keep them informed during the decision-making process. The system as it operates right now relegates victims to pieces of evidence that they can do with that. That's why some of the answers you have heard today have been, well, this is what we can do without relying on the victim and still prosecute those who are accused. What we need to do is do something more than offer victims incarceration as prosecution. And that means having other people who aren't prosecutors in the room during intake to understand exactly what the victim is going through, what they would like to see happen, and ensure that they are part of the decision-making process. Um, and I think that's what needs to be done in this office to hear victims, to understand their needs, and take them serious instead of disproving and discrediting them so that we can do away with them. Thank you, Ms. Abushi. Ms. Crotty. I've represented defendants and victims, and I think the most important thing we can do for victims is listen to them and listen to them and respect their opinions and hear what they really have to say. Um, I've been hired by victims because the district attorney's office did not want to listen to them. I think that has to change immediately. I think witness safety too is, is another thing. I was asked in a, um, we, have to, we have to protect witnesses. If we protect witnesses and they feel protected and they trust the district attorney's office, they're much more willing to come forward to testify. There is an inherent distrust that we, we have to work on. I think also too, the other thing is, is we have to hire um, the, who we hire as an assistant DAs is a very important thing. They are on the front lines. They are talking to people and talking to victims, talking to witnesses, sometimes defendants. There has to be some sort of emotional IQ of understanding people. It's not just a legal job. It's a people job. And we can't forget that. And I think that that's really the most important thing is hiring people who understand that part of the job is to really talk and interact with people and understand their stories. And, and that's the most important thing that they are going to do as assistant DAs. And I think that will go a long way for victims and witnesses. Thank you, Ms. Crotty. All right, for the next question, we're going to have, uh, sorry, Ms. Lang lead off. So the question is, short again, mercifully, as district attorney, would you change the existing policy with respect to the disclosure of discoverable material? I don't know what the status is at this moment of discoverable material, but I believe that we need to implement open file discovery, but ensure that there are protections for vulnerable victims. So that means seeking protective orders when it comes to disclosing personal identifying information of victims who are at risk, but otherwise being totally transparent with the defense. One practice that I used was akin to uh, a reverse proffer in which I invited people who were charged with crimes to come in with their lawyers so I could lay the evidence out for them so that there are no surprises. And I would encourage every prosecutor in my office to undertake a similar process at the very early stages of the case. No one should be playing hide the ball here. Thank you, Ms. Lang. Ms. Crotty. I mean, I think that the disclosure, I've practiced um, in all five of the boroughs, sometimes not really Staten Island, but in all the other bureaus, when you go and do an arraignment and they give over, a, and especially in misdemeanor cases, they give over all the discovery and a, at least all the police paperwork. Um, I think that, especially too, when there is a non-victim case, all the paperwork should be handed over immediately what's, it, what's in their possession. Um, I think that the more information that is given, and I know this as a defense attorney, the more information is given, the better you can defend your client and to the situation that they're realistically facing. Um, and I think that the more information that is be being given helps the, the entire case, both for the district attorney's office and for the defense. And I think that it should be an equal playing field of giving information when they, when they get it. I do think that um, with victim cases and witness ID, those are special cases, and I think that has to have some sort of consideration for that. But in general, everything should be given over as in time as to when they get it. Thank you, Ms. Crotty. Mr. Court, same question. Whoever the district attorney is in 2022, 
will have to comply with specific standards of discovery and disclosure because of the laws I helped negotiate in Albany and that we in Albany passed and with no help from the district attorney, Cy Vance at that time. In fact, he's been uh, objecting to it for the better part of five years. Um, and it's important to note that because of a question that came back earlier about what is the role of advocacy for the district attorney? And as it turns out, it's a lot for Manhattan because Cy Vance has been at the forefront through the District Attorneys Association of fighting discovery reform for a be better part of 10 to 15 years. I'm proud of my work in Albany, opposing Vance, opposing the District Attorneys Association and forcing basic disclosure, which stands for this basic premise. We do not move forward with a case. We do not seek to deprive somebody of their liberty before we turn over basic discovery to their defense attorney. Thank you, Mr. Court. Ms. Weinstein. Thank you. Um, a new law went into effect a year ago uh, requiring uh, the, the state to come into line with what was basically the practice beforehand in Brooklyn of early and open discovery and an emphasis on early. And the time periods have adjusted now in terms of how many days you get after the first appearance. Uh, but the change is, is basically the same in keeping with what we had done and also in keeping with my own practice as a federal prosecutor. Uh, I, I said earlier that a criminal trial, a litigation is a search for truth. And I think that early and open disclosure of information is a key component of that. And in in fact, uh, in my supervision of the Conviction Review Unit, we also vacated convictions where prosecutors had not complied with their discovery and constitutional obligations to disclose information to the defense. Thank you, Ms. Weinstein. Ms. Orleans. So I remember when Cy Vance ran for Manhattan District Attorney on the promise of open file discovery, and then he proceeded to spend the next decade fighting against it and allowing the district attorneys in his office to routinely hide the ball, as people referred to it as, and hide evidence from, from the defense, not turn things over, tell us that our lunch break was sufficient to review hundreds of pages of, of discovery and evidence and leading in the middle of trial or the morning of trial, and that is absolutely insufficient. It needs to go so much further than that. And so I believe that every Manhattan DA candidate should not only be in favor of open file discovery, but truly, except for genuine work product, the prosecutor's entire case file should be shared electronically and available at all times to the defense and immediately upon when the prosecution has any of that, it should be shared with the defense immediately. And I know the repercussions of not having that after spending over a decade as a public defender. Thank you, Ms. Orleans. Ms. Abushi. As a trial attorney, I've had my fair share of prosecutors withhold and manipulate evidence in the middle of trial or even during in a case. And I think uh, as people who hold positions of public trust, those who have engaged in that behavior should not serve in those positions. Um, open file discovery is necessary to do Anything else is to accept the violation of our constitutional rights, which requires transparency, especially when it comes time to the restrictions of our freedoms. So regardless of what the legislature is doing, and make no mistake, this problem didn't start with Vance. It's been the culture of our prosecution system for ages. We must allow open file discovery. I will make that initiative and I will also have uh, management and, and partner with agencies like CourtWatch to ensure that our prosecutors uh, are adhering to these requirements while also ensuring that the community and defense attorneys as well as civil rights attorneys are being made aware of all efforts to ensure transparency to the maximum extent possible. Thank you, Ms. Abushi. Mr. Bragg. Full and early disclosure is fair, just, humane. It's what the Constitution requires, uh, and, and it's what, what I've done throughout my career. Uh, and I'll say we don't have to wait on Albany. When I was at the Attorney General's office, one of my first duties as Chief Deputy was prior to the bail law being changed, retraining the entire division to focus them on the non-cash options. So that's the type of leadership I would bring to the DA's office, not waiting uh, on Albany. And one specific issue I want to lift up, which others haven't addressed, is, is police misconduct and the disclosure of that. I fought uh, hard side by side with advocates for the repeal of 50A, which uh, used to provide overly protective, uh, insane uh, protection to police officers' disciplinary records. Uh, 
we need to continue to breathe life in that. I submitted a Mika's brief along with other other folks. The unions are trying to push back on that. We need to make sure that that is uh, fully honored by our prosecutors because that's a big, big piece of the equation for discovery. Thank you, Mr. Bragg. We're in the home stretch. Last question, and this one is going to. I actually didn't answer. Oh, Miss Florence, sorry, <laughs> you fell off my radar screen. Please. No worries. Um, so, I'll, should I start now? Yes, please do. Okay. Yeah. So, to me, discovery is not simply about documents because you can you can dump lots of documents, especially in the age of of, of digitized evidence. It's very important for the defendant and the defense attorney to understand the evidence. Throughout my career, I engaged in open discovery before that was even a thing. And what I did was not only give the evidence over, but have an open door policy where I met with defense attorneys and, and, under, and explained the evidence to make sure that we were all on the same page. On the other side, I also listened because sometimes we get it wrong. And it's important when the defense attorney has all the evidence that we listen to the defenses and make sure that the case that has been charged is the case that can be proven. Thank you, Ms. Florence. And now for the last question. Um, and we propose that um, we're gonna have you answer this and then we're gonna let you have two minutes in closing. So as you're listening to other people, you might think about it because um, I've been so rigorous with the timekeeping, we seem to have enough for you to be able to do a closing statement, which I'm actually quite delighted about. So okay. just, just, just to clarify, I think we can do uh, two minutes total, including their answer to the next question. Two minutes total. Yeah. Everybody clear? Okay. Um, Ms. Crotty, you're gonna start us off. And the final question is, what would you do to address the concern of some that favorable treatment is given to high profile and well-connected defendants? And would there be any piece of that with, that it would involve reparations or remedial action of any sort? I mean, I think you have to have basic fairness. You, it, you have transparency and you treat every case the same. Um, and I think when you, if, you if that is your goal, then you can do it. I have said from the beginning on day one that you have to look at each and every case and look at each and every case to get the fair and right result. And that doesn't matter how poor you are or how rich you are. That's just the way you should look at. And if that is the matrix in which you look at every case, I think that that's where you get fundamental fairness. And I think that that's where you get equity. And so that's what I would do on every case. I know that the dis there are disparate impacts at times. I know that firsthand because I've represented people with disparate impacts, but I do think you have to, it doesn't change the matrix of how you look at the case because when you're the district attorney, you look at it to be fair and to get the right thing and to do the right thing in each and every case. And that's what I would do. I'm here tonight because I wanna be the next district attorney. I'm here tonight because I think I've presented a realistic vision of understanding New York and the city that we live in and that we love. I grew up here, I'm from here, and I've been here and my whole career has been here. I think this, and my whole career has been rooted in 100 Center Street, both as a defense attorney and as a prosecutor. I think that we can really make the system work better and work for all of us. And that's what I propose to do. No one here has had the perspective of both sides as I have in the building. And no one here can know fundamentally what is going on in that building. In fact, I still am working today. I still do cases. I have a court appearance tomorrow. I know what's going on in, those, in the building and I know how to fix it and I know what to concentrate on. And I have the best understanding of the system and it has been 20 years in the making. And that is what makes me the best candidate to be the next DA. My website is uh, lizcrotty2021.com. Um, if you have any questions, please contact me there. I thank, thank you all tonight for coming and I appreciate the time. Thank you, Ms. Crotty. Ms. Orleans, two minutes. This is for the answer and then our closing, yes? Yes. Got it. Um, so I think it's time to restore trust and integrity to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. No one is above the law. I will ensure that those who are wealthy, powerful, or well-connected who break the law are held accountable by creating specialized bureaus that combat 
corrupt public officials, exploitative landlords and employers, as well as law enforcement officers who commit acts of physical abuse and perjury and who engage in violations of civil rights. Um, I think it's incredibly important and I've spent my entire career as a public defender. So I've seen the way in which our current system polices people and harms communities. And in the more than a decade I've spent going up against Cy Vance's office, I've represented over 3000 people charged with crimes, as many as 180 cases at one time on cases ranging from turnstile jumping to homicide. And for every case that I've worked on, I've managed countless moving parts. I've led teams, interviewed witnesses, taking cases all the way to trial, and I've had to do that on a limited budget without ever losing sight of the human beings at the heart of each case. We must stop elevating career prosecutors to positions of power. We must finally acknowledge what the harms of this system really, really have meant. And that's why someone like me, a public defender, someone who has spent my career fighting against this office in court, makes me the most prepared to implement the policies that I speak of and to make sure that our criminal legal system is taken on in a way that is going to dismantle the system that currently exists, that makes sure that we hold police officers accountable and make sure that, that all of this misconduct is identified, called out, and then rectified. And I think that there is, um, you know, there's so much that needs to be done. Sorry, sirens, you know, this is my, my neighborhood. Um, and and I, I, I come at this of the perspective of having represented thousands of people and seen the way that this has really impacted their lives. And I would be honored to receive your support and thank you for having me tonight and for such a great forum and thanks for the timekeeping and everything else. Thanks, Ms. Orleans. Mr. Bragg. There's no doubt that there's two systems of justice. There's one uh, that has allowed those with uh, privilege to avoid accountability for far too long. Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein, uh, the former doctor, uh, at Columbia who sexually assaulted dozens of patients. Uh, and then that's the first system. Then there's the second system, one that has been unduly harsh uh, for people who look like me, people in communities of color, people who are in poverty, people with mental health issues. Uh, I know that second system of justice. I've grown up in it. My family's still in it. Uh, I was over-policed. Um, many of my friends overcharged and through the system. Uh, family has been incarcerated. I know the system uh, firsthand. Uh, I also know not just the civil rights challenges of the system, but the public safety issues that are beset upon those of us in the second system. You know, having faced down the barrel of a gun six times in my life, I know that firsthand. Uh, I know the challenges of reentry through my family members who've gone through that, one of whom has lived with me. It's important to know this work personally. I've built on that personal knowledge with a career that's fought for 20 plus years in the courtroom for both civil rights and public safety. There's no one here who can say that both a civil rights lawyer and a former prosecutor. I'm representing Eric Garner's family fighting for justice there, and I've prosecuted an FBI agent. I've done cases involving gun trafficking and heinous sex offenses. I've lived every bit of this system. Uh, I'm ready on day one to uh, inherit the Trump case, to take on uh, the flow of illegal guns into our, our city, to deal with the reentry and civil rights issues on day one. This is my life. This is my life's work. Justice cannot wait. I'm ready. Thank you, Mr. Bragg. Mr. Quart. Yes, uh, the problem uh, about when candidates talk about what day one in office will look like is that it really poses the question, will day one of their term in office be any different than year 10 or year nine or your year eight of Cy Vance's tenure? And that is really the, the distinction in this race. It is for me and all the other candidates in this race, but certainly those who are prosecutors. Who is really gonna bring about that fundamental change of this office? Who is really committed to ripping apart and rebuilding an office that I don't think functions well for, for basic values and Democrats in Manhattan or all, all 1.6 million Manhattanites in Manhattan? And my argument to everyone is look at my history. Look at the fights I've taken on over the last 10 years. Um, I have taken on Vance. I've taken on the New York Post. I have fought these fights. And most importantly, I've had to actually answer to voters in primary and general elections and defend my views on decarceration and reform of our criminal legal system. On that critical issue, on that critical question to everyone, who's really going to stick with it? Who's going to really stick with these reforms when, when the regressive voices that exist in, in this city go after the DA? 
I think you can answer. There's no guesswork with me. You know from my record, you know from my fights, you know from my standing for re-election with these battles in Albany and in the courtroom that I will stick with it and I will go forward with the vision that I have outlined for you tonight. Thank you, Mr. Quart. Ms. Florence. You know, the Manhattan DA, your next DA, must have deep experience in the criminal law, doing the cases in the trenches, but also management of diverse teams and an innovative approach. But most important, it requires someone with a vision. There is no one in this race that has my combination of management experience, practical experience, and vision. And that comes out of the work that I did every single day for almost 25 years. I know how to find the cases that impact people. I know how to manage the people who will bring those cases. And I know how to make sure the work is done and with high morale. My career started more than 25 years ago in the very office I seek to lead. I fought there against a concierge system under this DA. And I fought for people who never thought they'd win. I went up time and time again against powerful interest inside and outside the office. I prosecuted large scale corruption. Trump case is coming either by this DA or the next one. And there is no one better equipped to handle that case. No matter what the Van Vance brings, there is more to be done. There's wage theft, there's vendor fraud, there's sexual assault. There are so many things that, that could be done against Mr. Trump and you need someone who has that deep experience. My experience is about landmark convictions, innovating in the criminal law. I have done cases involving 9-11 fraud, domestic violence, Violence, international trafficking of guns and, traf and contraband, and I have focused on tenants and immigrants and workers. As your DA, I will continue to fight against the power. I will stand up to them on behalf of everyday New Yorkers because that's what I've done my entire life. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Florence. Ms. Weinstein. Thank you so much. You know, as I look over my notes for what we talked about in the last two hours, for me, every single one of these subjects comes back, not just to experience, but to leadership experience and diversity of experience. I'm thinking about violent crimes, the questions we had about gun trafficking, about domestic violence, about the insecurity that people are feeling in terms of their personal safety, which I saw so many questions about um, in the side comments that we didn't get to, uh, to innovation, to having experience leading, creating innovation programs, whether it's diversion or a whole new program of using civil litigation to look out for the most vulnerable. And of course, the management experience of having worked in the front office of an office just like this one in advocating in doing the work of reform, transformation, modernization of the office, of disseminating policies into the office on every important subject, including discovery, of evaluating prosecutors differently. And you know, I think the next person who is going to assume this historic office is going to do so at a time where this borough is really traumatized by the pandemic and by all of the dislocations that have followed from it, insecurity around people's mental health, uh, loss of jobs, a change in the way the streets feel. And at a moment of crisis like that, there's no time to waste. There's no time to say, well, I did something similar in a similar case, or I had an idea that was interesting. Let me now try to put it into motion. We need to have somebody in this role who can draw on experience in the federal system, the state system, inside of courts, standing in front of judges, working with judges, having taught all of the subjects that we taught, talked about tonight, and again, having led so that we can get through this next difficult period in New York City and do the very best that we can for our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weinstein. Ms. Lang. I launched this campaign with a plan to address precisely this issue, Professor, because there is no equal justice without equal access. So I'm committed to a district attorney's office in which there are no backroom meetings, in which public defenders have the same access to the district attorney and district attorney senior staff that the most well-heeled white shoe defense attorneys have. And any even suggestion that someone has a special access to the district attorney but by dint of who they are or who their attorney is undermines the public's confidence in the system, and that must not stand. 
I am also committed to including public defense defenders on the transition team to assist in building precisely the infrastructure that's needed to operationalize these transformative reforms and to serving in an ongoing fashion on an advisory council. I am committed to having line assistants and district attorney, rather, and defense attorneys present for all meetings and negotiations about what's going to happen on cases because the worst thing that can happen is for the district attorney to take a private meeting with the defense attorney and then to come out and issue a decision that undermines the public's confidence with no explanation. On Super Bowl Sunday, uh, several years ago, two masked gunmen came out from behind a car and opened fire, hitting five people and killing one. I worked with the uh, family who lost the young man that night to build the case and prosecute it. And the day after the conviction, I called the mother of the young man who'd been killed and asked how she felt. And she said, when I woke up, oh, I slept all night for the first time since he was killed, but when I woke up, all I could think about were the moms of those two young men, referring to the men who had just killed her son. I have lived in Harlem for close to 20 years. I'm from the city. I served in Chinatown and I will be a district attorney for everyone in Manhattan in every neighborhood, uptown, downtown, the Upper East and Upper West Sides, Harlem and Washington Heights. I, as a national criminal justice reform leader and a former assistant district attorney, am committed to a system that treats everyone with dignity. I hope that you'll join me Follow me on my website, votelucylang.com, and on social media, at LucyLangNYC. I would be so proud to stand with you three estimable clubs in moving my candidacy forward. Thank you for a really vibrant conversation tonight and for your service to the city. Thank you, Ms. Lang. Ms. Abushi, the last word is yours. Thank you so much. Um, to get back to the first part of the question, um, you know, people of color, have been made to be the face of crime in this city. As someone that grew up with incarcerated parent, I spent over two decades growing up through the prison system, seeing my family struggle, seeing my mother figure out how to handle 10 kids who are at 10 different places in their life and living with the stigma that comes with prosecution and incarceration. That is the experience that's missing from all of our colleagues that I've heard from here today first-hand community experience in surviving the damage and destruction that the system has caused. And while people of color are targeted and torn down by this system, we see time and time again, people who are powerful and privileged escape accountability, escape any kind of liability and be offered as many exceptions as possible. And so even the question about Trump that we see in the media is, should we prosecute someone like Trump who's been accused of rape and sexual assault and stealing from charities and theft and robbery and harassment and all the scary stuff that we're told uh, we are going to be subject to if we allow equal justice to persist in our city. So there has to be one system for everyone, but it's going to take somebody who has lived through these experience and has hold the powerful and privileged accountable to make that happen. And so while many of my colleagues here can make these promises, they've all had an opportunity to actually do something about it and be fearless in the face of power. And unfortunately that has not happened. That's why we have a ton of oversight agencies against the NYPD, but not one could have secured the prosecution of a police officer when I have done it three times already. It's been very difficult to have victims heard in the process. And so regardless of how many programs we have in place, are we going to have somebody that has the lived experience fighting for victims, victims of police violence and other crimes alike to actually get this job done? I'm the only candidate that has navigated these adversarial waters for a decade and have worked to change policy, change the culture and ideology of our city, of our law enforcement, of the prosecution system. That is what it's going to take to change Manhattan. We can't have more of the same thing and expect a different outcome. That is what got us here. And that is why the voters of Manhattan are asking for something completely and utterly different. I am the only candidate to offer you that. I did not have to work for decades to incarcerate communities, destabilize families, or watch incarcerated communities like they're some kind of zoo to do something about it. I come from these communities. I'm passionate about ensuring the stability and safety of all New Yorkers and looking forward to a future where we have high graduation rates, entrepreneurship rates, homeownership rates, and opportunities. Uh, I got muted in the middle of it, but if that's my cue, I'm just going to wrap up and say, um, 
we need something different for Manhattan. I am that something different and I enjoy these experiences all on my own. And I look forward on taking on uh, this momentous task with the community, with all of you by my side. Thank you so much for this amazing event tonight. And I look forward to earning your support as the next district attorney of Manhattan. Thank you, Mr. Bushi. Thank you to every one of you for the sustained and rigorous engagement. It gives me hope for our future. And now I'm gonna give this back to Alec, who's gonna close us out. Great. Well, first, thank you so much, uh, Professor Brett Dignam for doing an outstanding job moderating for us. Um, to all the candidates for taking the time to be here with us. I wanna thank my colleague, Pablo Zavaios for administering the logistics, all of the behind the scenes work of the Zoom meeting. I wanna recognize some of our elected officials who are with us, State Senator Robert Jackson and City Council Member Helen Rosenthal. The primary election for district attorney is June 22nd, 2021. In the meantime, there is a fundraising deadline on January 11th, which I'm sure all the candidates will be working hard toward. So thank you for taking the time to be with us um, and please be sure to vote this year. <laughs>